Every day, we're exposed to countless pathogens, but don't get sick every time. So how does the body recognize and fight these pathogens? Let's discuss this step by step. The first physical line of defense is provided by the skin and mucous membranes. In the airways, mucus, ciliary motion, and coughing are important defense mechanisms. In addition, bodily secretions also protect us from pathogens. For example, saliva contains lysozyme, which can destroy the cell wall of gram-positive bacteria. If we take a look at the stomach, gastric acid creates a hostile environment for most bacteria. Also, the normal flora residing on the skin and mucous membranes displace and fight pathogens. If the pathogen ends up breaching these barriers, the body depends on further active defense mechanisms of the immune system. First, the cells involved in innate immunity become active. Certain stimuli, such as tissue injury, trigger an inflammatory reaction. As a result, leukocytes, especially granulocytes and macrophages, are attracted to the site of damage. They leave the adjacent blood cells and penetrate into the damaged tissue. The body recognizes certain specific repeating patterns present on many pathogens as foreign. These include, for example, lipopolysaccharides, which are located on the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria. These characteristics are also called pathogen-associated molecular patterns, in short, PAMPs. Because they're commonly shared between different pathogen subtypes, they're considered nonspecific. The macrophages and granulocytes attracted by the inflammation recognize the PAMPs of pathogens through pattern recognition receptors, in short, PRR. The granulocytes then secrete a toxic substance to fight against the invading bacteria. The macrophages engulf the bacteria, or in other words, phagocytose them. In addition, PAMPs activate the complement system. This system consists of many different proteins that initially circulate in the blood and tissue in an inactive state. These proteins are activated by pathogens, leading to a cascade of reactions. This leads to three effects. First, more leukocytes are attracted to the site, which stimulates the inflammation. Second, the complement components mark the pathogens, facilitating phagocytosis, which is required for some pathogens. Third, the complement cascade leads to the formation of the membrane attack complex, in short, MAC, which produces pores that especially kill gram-negative bacteria. As well as the innate immune system, the adaptive immune system is also activated. Its reactions start at a later stage, and the response is initially slower. Through its high degree of specificity, the adaptive immune system can efficiently fight against the invading pathogen, preventing it from spreading. Antigen-presenting cells, such as macrophages and dendritic cells, represent the intersection between the innate and adaptive immune systems. These cells take up microbial components, known as antigens, process them, and present them on the cell surface via MHC molecules, which stands for Major Histocompatibility Complex. As a result, the adaptive immune system is activated. How macrophages and dendritic cells present antigens can be seen in our video on antigen presentation. The decisive cells of the humoral immune system are T and B cells. They circulate in the blood, but are also present in lymphatic tissues such as lymph nodes, tonsils, and intestinal mucosa. Their immune response is triggered by antigens. T and B cells become activated upon contact with the antigen specific to their receptor. Let's first look at T cells, which comprise two main groups. T cells are divided into two subsets based on their surface proteins, CD4 positive T cells and CD8 positive T cells. CD4 positive T cells are also called T helper cells. They activate macrophages and granulocytes or help to activate B cells. CD8 positive cytotoxic T cells kill virus infected or tumor cells. Now, let's take a closer look at CD4 positive T cells. The dendritic cell presents the uptaken antigen on its surface via MHC class II receptors to CD4 positive T cells. The corresponding CD4 positive T cell binds via the antigen specific T cell receptor and other auxiliary proteins to the dendritic cell. The release of chemical messengers, 
namely cytokines, induces CD4-positive T-cell proliferation. Depending on the pathogen, the CD4-positive T-cell differentiates into one of several subtypes. These principally develop into different T-helper cells, regulatory T-cells, and over time, into memory T-cells. A special group is the follicular helper T-cells, in short, TFH cells, which are important for B-cell activation. We'll get back to them again later. Regulatory T-cells suppress an excessive immune response. Memory cells remain in the body for years and elicit an immediate adaptive immune response to subsequent exposure to the same antigen. Depending on the invading pathogen, other T-helper cells activate the cells of the innate immune response through cytokines. In addition to CD4-positive T-cells, CD8-positive T-cells can also be activated. In contrast to CD4-positive T-cells, these cytotoxic T-cells are activated by MHC class 1 antigen presentation and not MHC class 2. Cytotoxic T-cells recognize virus-infected or damaged cells and induce programmed cell death, also termed apoptosis. Now, on to B-cells. These cells can fight off pathogens with antibodies. B-cells can recognize antigens in one of two ways. Like T-cells, they can detect presented antigens. Also, they can recognize antigens directly without antigen presentation. Once a B cell finds the antigen matching its receptor, it's then presented via MHC class 2 on the cell surface. If this antigen is recognized by a matching, previously formed TFH cell, it then binds to the B cell with its T cell receptor and auxiliary proteins. After this double check, the B cell is activated by cytokines and starts to proliferate. As a result, memory and plasma cells are formed. Both memory B and T cells are responsible for a rapid immune response to reinfection. The plasma cell produces antibodies that match the antigen on the pathogen. Initially, IgM antibodies are formed. After interaction of the plasma cell with the T helper cell, high affinity IgG antibodies and other antibodies that are adapted to specific needs are generated. The antibodies now bind to the invading pathogen. The final stage of the adaptive immune response comprises three parts. First, antibody binding can render the pathogen harmless. Second, this binding results in more efficient phagocytosis through opsonization. Third, the complement system is reactivated. As mentioned previously, this enables the pathogen to be directly lysed by the membrane attack complex. However, other leukocytes are also attracted leading to opsonization of the pathogen, thereby facilitating phagocytosis. Let's summarize the most important facts about the immune response. The innate immune system provides a rough recognition and rapid first line of defense to invading pathogens. Antigen-presenting cells activate the adaptive immune system and establish a link between the innate and adaptive immune systems. Through antibodies and cytotoxic T cells, the adaptive immune system enables a highly efficient, although late response against the invading pathogen. Because of its immune memory, it elicits a highly rapid response upon renewed infection. In this process, the complement system plays an important part in two respects. First, it's involved in initiating the innate immune response. Second, it's part of the common final pathway of the innate and adaptive immune responses. So, innate and adaptive immunity are interlinked in many ways.